Hello and welcome to a short biography on Vlad III, also known as Vlad the Impaler. Before I begin, I'd like to point out that some of the names of places and people will be genuinely difficult for me to pronounce correctly, and I will most likely pronounce some of the, these places and people incorrectly. Please overlook this. Vlad III, Prince of Wallachia, was born in the winter of 1431 CE the son of Princess Snejna of Moldavia and Vlad II of Wallachia in the town of Sigasora and region of Transylvania. He had two older half-brothers, Mercia II and Vlad Kelu Girl, as well as a younger brother, Radu III the Fair. His father was initiated into the Order of the Dragon, a monarchical chivalric order founded by the King of Hungary in the year Vlad was born. Vlad and his brother Radu spent their childhood in Sigasora under the supervision of their mother as well as the wives of exiled boyars. At one point in their father's first rule, Vlad and his brother were brought to Targovista, the capital of Wallachia. Here they likely received an exceptional education from both Roman and Greek scholars, studying geography, mathematics, science, languages, among other subjects. At about the age of 13, Vlad and his brother Radu were sent to live as political hostages in the Ottoman Empire, a relatively common practice at the time. Their father had ascended the throne of Wallachia in 1436, but was ousted in 1442 by rival faction leaders working together and with the assistance of Hungarian leaders. Vlad's father sought help from the Ottomans, which was granted. Life for Vlad in the Ottoman court located in Edirne was unpleasant. His stubborn behavior resulted in beatings from his Turkish stewards on many occasions. These years would have a long-lasting impression on him, greatly increasing his hatred for the Ottoman Empire. Meanwhile, his brother Radu flourished while there converting to Islam and later becoming a commander of an elite Ottoman military unit of Janissary soldiers. This would lead Vlad to despise his brother as a traitor. At some point, Vlad was taken from the Ottoman court to be educated in logic as well as languages, such as Persian, though still in the Ottoman Empire. With his father reclaiming the throne, Vlad was eventually released from the Ottomans and returned to Wallachia. Vlad Dracul II, Vlad's father, was murdered in a conspiracy between high-ranking boyars in Wallachia and John Hunyadi, a powerful Hungarian regent, in December 1447. Dracul's eldest son, Mercia, was blinded and buried alive by the boyars at Targoviste to prevent him from the throne. In an attempt to prevent Hungarian control of Wallachia, the Ottomans invaded the country, placing Vlad on the throne as a shadow government controlled by Mehmed II, the Ottoman Sultan. This reign of Vlad's would be short-lived, with Hungarian troops invading Wallachia and placing the head of another clan, Vladislav II, as king. At this time, Vlad fled Wallachia, moving to Moldavia, where he lived under the protection of his uncle, Bogdan II. In October 1451, his uncle was murdered, and Vlad was forced to flee again, this time to Hungary. While there, Vlad made a reputation for himself, due in large part to his vast knowledge of the Ottoman Empire and his hatred for the Ottomans. He was made an advisor to Hunyadi as a result. Ottoman influence in the Balkans was greatly magnified with the fall of Constantinople in 1453 CE. With the Byzantine Empire now overthrown, all of Europe was threatened by the Ottomans. Less than 30 years later, the entire Balkan Peninsula would be controlled by the Islamic Empire. In 1456, three years after the fall of Constantinople, the Ottomans laid siege against Belgrade, threatening Hungary. A counterattack against the Ottomans was conducted by Hunyadi into Serbia, relieving the siege. It was at this time that Vlad led his own force into Wallachia, killing Vladislav II in hand-to-hand -hand combat. With this, Vlad resumed the role as king of Wallachia. 
Back in his homeland, Vlad realized that years of endemic warfare between the rival boyars for control left Wallachia in trouble, with crime rampant, little agricultural output, and virtually no trade. Vlad had three goals for his kingdom. To increase the military, strengthen trade in the economy, and to increase and secure his own political power. Soon enough, Vlad's focus was on dealing with the boyars who he considered a source of strife for the country. Many of the leading nobles were executed and their positions of power given to people of obscure origins, whose loyalty would be to Vlad alone. The army was also strengthened with a small contingent of mercenaries who served as bodyguards for their king. An auxiliary force was also created by Vlad, made up of peasants who could be called to duty when needed. To improve the economy and help the merchants of Wallachia, he limited foreign trade to three cities, Targsor, Campulung, and Targoviste. About this time, Vlad began significant repairs and improvements to his main fortress in Wallachia, the Poenari Castle. He captured the families of the boyars and put them to work, effectively making them slaves. The rebuilding of the castle was difficult work, and many of the slaves working on it died in the process. Those who could no longer work due to disease or weakness were summarily executed as an example for the other slaves, who eventually worked naked after their clothes wore out and fell off. Vlad's treatment of the boyer slaves would be only the beginning to his cruel nature. Vlad's disdain for weakness fell also onto his own people. In an effort to clear his kingdom of those who he felt weren't contributing enough to it, Vlad ordered anyone he considered to be lazy, unproductive, those with persisting illnesses, the handicapped, and those born into poverty, to a banquet in the great hall of Tirgovista. Once inside, they were provided a feast that few of them had ever had. At the end of the banquet, Vlad made his appearance. With the full attention of all, he asked them if they would like to never feel hunger again, which was met with much enthusiasm. It was at this point that Vlad left the hall and ordered his troops to board up all the exits. They then set the hall ablaze, killing all within. Connections between the Wallachian nobility and Transylvanian Saxons encouraged Vlad to conduct multiple raids into Transylvania. He restricted or eliminated their trading privileges and had several leading Saxon settlers impaled. It was also in Transylvania that he partially avenged the murder of his brother Mercia by condemning to death a dynasty prince suspected in taking part. The doomed prince was forced to read his own eulogy while kneeling before his own grave. At this time Sultan Mehmed II claimed all of Wallachia as a part of the Ottoman Empire while Vlad allied with the Kingdom of Hungary. With Ottoman expansion in the Balkans, Pope Pius II called for another crusade in 1459, to which Vlad was the only European leader that showed any enthusiasm. Also in 1459, Sultan Mehmed II sent envoys to meet with Vlad and coerce him into paying a tribute of 10,000 ducats and 500 recruits for the Ottoman Empire. Vlad refused. Furthermore, Vlad claimed that the envoys refused to show him respect as a sovereign by raising their hats to him, and as a punishment, he had their turbans nailed to their heads. In reality, Vlad had done this to encourage Sultan Mehmed II into war. Vlad's military campaigns south of Wallachia eventually gave him a strong presence around the Danube River, which lay between Wallachia and the regions controlled by the Ottomans. Sultan Mehmed II sent a large force led by Hamza Pasha, an Ottoman chieftain, into the areas around the Danube with 10,000 mounted soldiers, to seek either plans for a peace treaty or to eliminate Vlad. While riding through a narrow pass north of Gyurgyu, Vlad launched his ambush, quickly surrounding Hamza and his forces. All of those captured were sentenced to death and impaled. Hamza himself was impaled on the largest spike in honor of his higher rank. Rumors began to spread throughout Wallachia that Vlad III was somewhat of a monster, eating the flesh of his victims as well as drinking their blood. 
He was also known to hold banquets in the field, surrounded by his dying enemies who were impaled. On one occasion, as the story goes, he was sharing a meal with one of his military leaders, who complained about the overwhelming stench of death via those impaled. Vlad had the man impaled himself, placing him on a stake higher than the rest. Upon this, Vlad called up to the leader, telling him that as he was now impaled higher than all of the others, that he would therefore be above the stench. In the winter of 1462, Vlad led his forces south into Bulgarian lands between Serbia and the Black Sea, attacking Ottoman forces wherever he found them. Vlad would disguise himself as a Turkish Sipahi, or Ottoman cavalry unit, to infiltrate his enemy's camps and annihilate them. In a letter that Vlad wrote to Matthias Corvinus, then king of Hungary, he claimed to kill well over 20,000 Bulgars and Turks, and concluded the letter, Thus, your highness, you must know that I have broken the peace with him, meaning Sultan Mehmed II. Almost immediately, the Ottoman Sultan raised an army of 60,000 regular troops, supported with another 30,000 light-armored auxiliaries, who marched to Wallachia. Vlad's forces, while superior man-to-man, -man, were numbered at no more than 40,000, and the numbers of the Ottoman army proved unstoppable. The Ottomans marched into the Wallachian capital, Targoviste. While pitched battle was not an option for Vlad and his forces, they nonetheless used guerrilla warfare to antagonize the Ottoman troops. One encounter that proved very successful for Vlad was called the Night Attack, a skirmish fought on June 17, 1462, in which 15,000 Turks were killed. These relatively small skirmishes ebbed the strength from the Turks, with Vlad actually achieving victories against several Ottoman Sipahi commanders. These losses angered Mehmed II, who himself led a force into the region. Vlad's success against the Turks provided him with gratitude from a number of people, notably the Saxons of Transylvania, the Italian states, and even the Pope. A Venetian envoy, while in the court of Hungary, heard of Vlad's military campaigns and defense of Wallachia, and claimed in response that all of Christianity should celebrate Vlad's success against the Turks. The Turkish incursion into Vlad's kingdom resumed, despite Vlad's victories in the south. His brother, now named Radu Bey, was given the sole charge by Sultan Mehmed II to lead the Turkish armies into Wallachia with victory at all cost. Radu's elite battalion of Janissary troops, paid infantrymen armed with early forms of shoulder-fired rifles, were well supplied and they were able to fight their way deep into Vlad's realm, finally besieging his famous lair Poenari Castle. With this victory, the Sultan gave the title Bey of Wallachia to Radu. Although Vlad's military was outnumbered, they were by no means less able warriors. Another problem arose against Vlad, an issue he thought he had dealt with before, the treacherous boyars. Due to Vlad's prior mistreatment of the boyars, most of them sided with Radu and his Turkish army some of whom considered protection from the Ottomans better than that of Hungary. The boyars collaborated with Radu to the detriment of Vlad. Despite all this, Vlad's defeat ultimately came about as a result of lack of money. His mercenary army began to disintegrate as their pay ended, sending Vlad to the Hungarian court of Matthias Corvinus for aid. Rather than receiving help, Vlad was thrown into the dungeon for treason. Corvinus had been receiving financial support from the Pope to fight against the Turks and their advances into Europe. However, he used the money for personal reasons instead, and with the Ottomans approaching, he needed someone to blame, and that person was Vlad. The Hungarian king used false documents in the name of Vlad stating his loyalty to Sultan Mehmed II and making peace over Wallachia 
in the form of granting lands to the Turks. As a consequence, Vlad was imprisoned for over 10 years. His later years in prison were actually more akin to house arrest, finding Vlad married to a cousin of the Hungarian king and living with her in the capital. By 1474, at the age of 43, Vlad was released. A year later, his brother Radu suddenly died, and in 1476, Vlad invaded Wallachia with Hungarian support. His rule lasted little more than two months, with Vlad dying on the battlefield early in January 1477. Vlad's body was unceremoniously buried by one of his rivals, and his head was sent to Constantinople as a trophy. According to local legend, Vlad's first wife, who was a noblewoman, died during Radu's siege of Poenari Castle. The story goes that as the Turks were en route to the castle, an archer loyal to Vlad shot an arrow with a message into the tower of the castle. After reading the message, she flung herself to her death from the tower, saying she would rather rot and be eaten by fish than be led in captivity by the Turks. Vlad's second wife, Ilona Zilagia, bore him two sons, one of which would go on to father children into Hungarian nobility. Vlad is most well known for his sadistic nature. As a tyrant, he had many thousands of people put to death, invariably in a tortured manner. While Vlad enjoyed all manner of tortures, including burning and boiling people alive, dismemberment, flaying, and more, he is dubiously renowned for his favorite torture, impalement. Impalement is one of the most torturous ways to die. Normally, and in the case of Vlad's methods, a person is pierced through the rectum or vagina and then forced through the torso, exiting at the top of the sternum. The stake would be blunt at the tip so as to avoid piercing vital organs, which would lead to a quicker death. By doing so, the victim could take hours, if not days, to die. Once sufficiently impaled, the executioner would then hoist the victim into the air and the bottom of the stake planted in the ground. The victim's own weight would work with gravity to pull them down the stake. The villainous tyranny of Vlad seemed to be unquenchable. Anyone who offended Vlad in any way invariably met a tortured death. For example, any woman found to be unfaithful to her husband was impaled. If she had a child, it would also be impaled on the same stake as its mother, causing profound psychological torture on the poor woman, along with the physical torture of both. In order to prove to visiting dignitaries that his kingdom was free of crime, Vlad had a gold cup placed in the center square of Chergovista. The cup was left unguarded day and night, and was never taken. Such was the fear of Vlad his own people had of him. During Vlad's reign, he impaled many people, and in the case of his enemy armies, would impale thousands at a time. On one campaign by Sultan Mehmed II, Vlad had thousands of Turks impaled in a large field. Upon seeing this, the Sultan turned back in horror. Due to the fact that Vlad was waging war against the Muslim Turks, he and his methods of execution were officially sanctioned by the Vatican, which of course desired Christian domination in the Balkans and surrounding regions. Vlad III was known by two different names, one while he lived and the second given to him after death. While alive, he was called Vlad Dracula named after his father who was known as Vlad Dracul. The name Dracul was given to Vlad's father who was himself a member of the Order of the Dragon, with dragon being Dracul in older Romanian languages. By adding an A to the title Dracul, it becomes Dracula, which means son of the dragon. Although not quite as clear regarding etymology, Vlad may have also been known as Vlad, son of the devil. This epithet most likely helped inspire the later fiction writings of Bram Stoker, who himself is most known for his gothic novel, Dracula.
Vlad III was, after his death, known as Vlad Tepe. Tepe is Romanian for Impaler, so hence he was known as Vlad the Impaler, which persists to this day.